If you love Bioneers Radio, it's free and easy to support us. Just take a moment to post a review on our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find our show online. You'll be helping other people find and enjoy these incredible thinkers and storytellers. And thank you for helping us out. This week on The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. Broken places are my canvases. People's stories are my pigments. And the heart of it is the transformation of human heart. I'm Neil Harvey. It's making art that heals the broken places with artist Lily Ye. This week on The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is made possible in part by Organic Valley, a farmer-owned cooperative producing local food with the future in mind since 1988. Learn more at organicvalley.com. Vicious circles feed on themselves. The worse things get, the worse things get. How do we transform a vicious circle into a virtuous circle? How do we move from environmental degradation and the deterioration of human relations to restoration of both people and planet, from war to peace, from hatred to compassion, from isolation to community? How does our world turn from despair to hope? Daunting as it may seem, how can one person make a crucial difference? When internationally acclaimed artist Lily Ye was inspired to design a genocide memorial in Civil War-ravaged Rwanda, she invited author Terry Tempest Williams to be her scribe. The writer first said no. She wrote, I didn't want to be in a place so familiar with death. Then she changed her mind, in part because of Ye's exceptional reputation for community transformation. Their journey is chronicled in Terry Tempest Williams' book, Finding Beauty in a Broken World. The title refers in part to Lily Ye's approach to community healing through the creation of mosaics, taking that which is broken and creating something whole and wholly new and beautiful. This is where angels fear to tread, making art that heals the broken places. My name is Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. Born in mainland China and raised in Taiwan, Lily Ye learned the traditional art of Chinese painting as a teenager. In the 1960s, she moved to the United States and completed a Master of Fine Arts degree in painting. While teaching at the University of Arts in Philadelphia, she encountered an opportunity to take her artwork off the canvas and into the streets. She found the opportunity both thrilling and terrifying. I was invited to uh, create a park on an abandoned lot in inner city, North Philadelphia. And I think that began my journey. But I actually was very scared, very reluctant, didn't want to, and almost chickened out. Yeah. And then as that moment, wanting to withdraw, and then my voice, my inner voice spoke to me in a very fragile but very clear message. Yeah. And it, it says that if you don't rise to the occasion, the best of you will die, and the rest will not amount to anything. Instead of running from her fear, she embraced it. By accepting the invitation to create a park in a very broken place, she leapt into unknown territory. Inner city, North Philadelphia, I guess like anywhere inner city, is very, it's actually traumatized, very traumatized place. Ages, decades of different kinds of discrimination. It's a kind of subtle kind of violence, poverty, the violence of poverty, and being excluded and not having a voice, being silenced and so forth. And so it reflected, the violence in the society reflected in the violence of the place because you have so much abandoned land, houses leveled, it's like broken tooth on the streets and the shards and the uncaring indifference and so forth. 
And then it's called the bad land. If you don't need to go in, you don't. And if you can manage to get out, you get out. Funded by a meager $2,500 grant and equipped with little more than an artist's creative inspiration and spontaneous compassion, she embarked on a project that everyone said could not be done. But it's that voice said that you need to rise to the occasion. And I knew innately this maybe is the gateway leading me to my life. And so when I went in, even though the place was very scary, and it's such a sense of forlorn and abandonment, but I just feel that I needed to do this park for my life. And uh, I need to do it more than the people who live there. And so that's how it began, yeah. Lily Ye had no idea how to mobilize a community. But as an artist, she well understood the power of symbols to ignite visions. Provocatively, she walked to the center of the North Philadelphia vacant lot littered with detritus and broken lives. She picked up a stick and drew a circle around herself in the dirt. Curious children edged up to her and asked, What are you doing? How can we help? Together, they began to pick up the broken things on the ground and make a mosaic. The first adult to join the new team was a local homeless man named James Big Man Maxton. When Big Man came, he was a drug user, and he had no place to go. This hurricane, destructive force. Now we're making mosaic, piece by piece, piece by piece. His life began to be restored. People passing him said, ah, blue, this is beautiful. This pattern is beautiful. You do that for us, this man, that's great. And the comment, the positive feedback he never got in his life. They are like rain dropped to a parched heart. He said, this feels good. Lily Ye's impact on North Philadelphia became like a pebble tossed into a pond. One small act of beauty created ever richer ripples radiating out in all directions. Children and adults in the neighborhood marveled as Big Man and Lily Ye created majestic murals of angels, no less. In the emerging community park, slowly Big Man found a new heartbeat in creativity. Over time, he traded his drug habit for a life of art in community. His transformation rippled out from block to block, conferring courage. If Big Man could change, anyone and everything could change. When he changed, the whole community went. So village start to host a narcotic anonymous meeting. Three, four groups come for maybe 16 years. Then we put our heads together then we renovate the buildings. Then we build houses. And there is abandoned industrial land, Westinghouse, two acre. And we turned, somebody came in to help us, my dear friend Ken Kolodje, and we turned it into a tree farm and little micro business. And it just goes on and on. That's how an art project becomes a village and sustainable, organic village. Lily Ye describes the village of arts and humanities as having its own cultural ecology. It turns the starved soil of vacant lots and broken hearts into rich ground where seeds of change can grow and thrive. In two decades, North Philadelphia residents have transformed 200 abandoned lots into 17 beautiful parks, gardens, and green spaces. The original vision of the village permeated the whole community for nearly 20 years, creating an unimaginably powerful cascade of virtues. We have theater. People's stories are like Shakespearean's tragic stories. Now, how do you heal it? By making it the most public way. It's like dead water, poisonous water. You massage it. You make it going through trees and stones. You pump it into the air. And finally, you speak it publicly. That's how you reintegrate it. From that, we have a youth theater. We have a rites of passage program. And we have teens speak. And then youth begin to travel and perform in other cities. And then we have um, health. 
we have health we're with uh, University Jefferson working with us. And then we had the farmer's market came to bring green. We have vegetable gardens and we built houses. <laughs> we renovate six on our own. The city came because we were organized. They said, can you help us? And so we built six homes for first time home buyers. And so <laughs> and the business community came to us and they were struggling and said that we need the village on our business street. And I realized that if the neighborhood is not doing good, we cannot thrive. And so the 204, we got a big grant. We launched and completed a 99 square block uh, shared prosperity planning. Everybody came and the goal is that we do it together. A living social sculpture begets a heart connection that transforms people and place. What we appreciate appreciates. Vicious circle becomes virtuous circle. In Philadelphia's village of arts and humanities, Lily Ye had shown how making community art can help heal poverty and rebuild community and the land. Now the strength of that transformative action would be put to the acid test to help heal the aftermath of the grisly genocide of Rwanda. In the spring of 1994, in the space of 100 nightmarish days, an estimated 800,000 Rwandans were slaughtered by their tribal neighbors. Most of the dead were Tutsi tribal members. Most of those who perpetrated the violence were Hutus. Sixteen years later, the country and its people are still ripped apart. 1.7 million displaced Hutus, afraid to return for fear of reprisals. 130,000 in prison upon suspicion of perpetrating acts of genocide. 400,000 widows. 500,000 orphans. Why did I go to Rwanda? I was at an international conference. I heard my guide, Jean Bosco Musana, his voice describing the suffering of Rwanda people touched me so much. My heart moved and I responded. I said, wait for me at the airport, I am coming. After nearly 18 years building the village in Philadelphia, Ye left the project in good hands. She created a nonprofit organization called Barefoot Artists to expand the vision internationally. The task in Rwanda was bold, to help community members build a memorial park so that the survivors of genocide on both sides could come together on hallowed ground to honor their dead, forgive the atrocity, and join hands to rebuild their country. Over the course of the next several years, the residents of Jisenyi, Rwanda, transformed a gruesome, haunted mass gravesite into a shrine of social healing and reconciliation. A glass-bejeweled mosaic on the altar reads, Tuibuke, let us remember. Lily Ye spoke about the Rwanda Healing Project at a recent Bioneers conference. When I first went there, it was very grave and sullen and no smiles and no colors. 100 families, two faucets, and sometimes the faucet breaks down. They have to walk two or three miles for a jerking of water of polluted river. And uh, how do you communicate when you don't speak the language, not shared history, art? You show the children the beauty, inspire them, they paint. I brought volunteers, and so we get the colors and we get children to paint. I put the best of their work on the wall. They become public art. This is how art is not imposed, but rooted in the community. How do you honor and respect the local people and honor the children? Before, it was just a place they temporarily stay, and uh, now it has character. It's their home. They identify, and it's a painted village. A little child painted a bowl about two inches long, and then I make it so big, very truthful to the drawing. European cows, because it gives a lot of milk, and this is a place on the edge of starvation and stunt growth. So I made the uterus extra long and seven kids to give out a lot of milk. <laughs> Community continued to paint their dreams. 
computers, cars, motorcycles, and goats. And lo and behold, sometimes dreams come true. Every family now has a goats. My friends in Philadelphia in Christmas time say, what can we give? Give goats. And now goats give birth to little goats and creating resources. This is how culture creates assets. Rain, water, water is life. No water, no life. Yet Rwanda has resources. They have two raining seasons. So Barefoot Artists was able to manage, get the resources, get funding, and then help them to get rain harvest tank. Every family now has access to good water, and then with solution, they have safe water. You see, making art in destitute place is like making fire in the dead, cold night of winter. It gives out warmth, gives out light, gives direction, and rekindles hope. And so, Engineer Without Borders, and they build wonderful sanitations. Every family has clean sanitations. Volunteer Alan Jacobson inspired create sunflower seeds oil production business. A person from NIT teach them to turn banana leaves into charcoal. And $4,000 launched the micro business loans. Now, people taking out loans and have little business and have a way to life and start to make money, start to have jobs. The older woman, 45 years and older, they say, with no job, no income, no money to buy soaps, we need help. We want to learn traditional basket weaving. I say, go and do it. So they learn the traditional way of doing it, harvesting yaka, beating it, scraping it, washing it in soap, and so many children watching. I say, put them to use, get them to draw and to document the whole process. And that's how you preserve the living museum, preserve the local culture, pass it on to the younger children in active role. And when you build the project, it's never linear. You, you need to respond to wherever people need to make it sustainable. They cannot see. How could they weave? So we invite the eye doctor come, and everybody has nice eyes. So they feel so proud, now they can see. And then they come together. When they weave together, they bond sistership sisterhood, and then support group for each other, and there is hope for the future. A group of young orphans, they were, their parents killed when they were seven to 10 years old, destitute and no way to uh, make a living. They say, we want to learn sewing, and now they sew beautiful things. 18 months intensive training in the community parade. They are so proud displaying what they sew, see whatever they sew, and then people dance, and now after 18 years, they graduate into launching a business. Barefoot artists manage and give them business. Everyone has a sewing machine, so now they can make a living provide for the family. The most recent but powerful, we managed to sponsor a solar energy engineer, um, Richard Kamm. He came and taught them solar energy production third training, 37 solar engineers in the Ruggerero Survivors Village, in the Community Pride Parade Day. They marched with the solar panels, not imported from America, not imported from Europe, produced and made in the Survivors Village in Rwanda. Paint dreams and they come true. Art lights a fire in the dead cold night of winter that gives warmth and light, direction and hope. Community pride, sisterhood, solar power from the inside out. By rearranging the broken pieces, this social mosaic from the heart fulfills a universal human longing to be connected with each other, to become whole, to create beauty from the heart of nature. I feel the most urgent issue is working on human transformation. And uh, then when you do art, it is so 
non-challenging. Human beings are so frail. We are so don't want to lose face. We have such false sense of dignity and wanting to hide our imperfections. And uh, so that's why broken places are so powerful, because we are laid bare. We have nothing to hide behind it. And so it's possible for violence to happen. It's also possible to direct connection to happen. It's real. It's real place. And uh, when I was in Rwanda, I really feel that it's terrible genocide happened, and also in the Holocaust and in Darfur. But it can happen anywhere if all of us don't look inward and balance the light and the darkness. We need both, and we need to make friends with the darkness in us. And we need to embrace that and integrate and be comfortable and be gentle. And then we can fall into the light. But if we cut it off and exclude it, lock it up, it turns poisonous and become deadly. We are human. We are not perfect. We are fallible. When we are aware of that, we are more able to forgive the other and understand the other. And that's the beginning of peace. This is my path. And I think broken places, I mean, that implies danger. And there was real physical danger I encountered. Um, but nothing compared to the depth I feel, the deep fulfillment I feel. Um, once you experience that, then you always want to go to that de depth or even deeper, the depth of connection, the depth of the impact, and uh, the depth of meaning in my own life. I feel that if I do this, then I can die. <laughs> it's a good living, then one can die well. And so, and I often think, you know, it's like we are all on a journey of the salmon. They're in ocean. They have to come back to the source of the beginning. And when they fly upstream, so many dangers. You know, the birds and the, the bears, and the, um, they scratch themselves. Also. I was so moved by watching that one in Alaska. And yet then they have to go back. It's nature. It's nature's call. And then they finally managed. They change form. They are transformed. They give birth. Then they die to nurture the next generation, to nurture the forest. So I feel that it's life's calling. That's my life, that I need to go to that depth to fulfill it. And just by just stay true to my calling and have the courage to respond to that. And you just do that. And you change like salmon. They die. They nurture their young. They go back to the ocean. And they feed so many other species. And they feed the forest. And that gives out the air that could protect the earth. I mean, one person is powerful. One living being is powerful just by stay true to our nature and just by dare to respond to the call and follow. I mean, look at Gandhi, follow his truth and he changed the world and give all of us courage. It's like that. Artist Lily Ye, one person staying true to her calling with the courage to respond. where angels fear to tread, making art that heals the broken places. Downloads of this program and many other Bioneers radio shows are available on the radio pages at Bioneers.org or by calling 1-877-BIONEER. 
That's 1-877-246-6337. Visit Bioneers.org where you can learn how to attend the annual October Bioneers National Conference and local Beaming Bioneers conferences. Purchase the radio series, conference CDs and DVDs, and Bioneers books. Join the thriving online Bioneers community and become a Bioneers member or make a donation. All at Bioneers.org or by calling one 877 Bioneer. The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Ausubel. Written by Catherine Stifter and Kenny Ausubel. Senior producer, Neil Harvey. Managing producer, Stephanie Welch. Production management, Aaron Leventman and Chuck Castleberry. Station relations by Creative PR. Distribution is by WFMT Radio Network. Original recordings provided by Focus Audio Visual. Interview recording engineer, Jeff Westman. Our theme music is taken from the album Journey Between by Baca Beyond and used by permission of Hannibal Records, a Ryko Disc label. Additional music was made available by Rasa Music at www.rasamusic.com. For more music information, please visit Bioneers.org. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature radio series are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join the Bioneers in inspiring a shift to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. This is program number 1310. Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is made possible in part by Organic Valley, a farmer-owned cooperative producing local food with the future in mind since 1988. Learn more at organicvalley.com.